Hi, uh, last time we looked at uh, how to look at the finding the equations of motion for a single degree of freedom, which is a generalized single degree of freedom. Uh, we saw that essentially the kind of uh, systems that we look at were assemblages of rigid bars and uh, you know uh, the entire system had one degree of freedom. Now, uh, was a single degree of freedom system and the overall point was that uh, you know what that degree of freedom uh, well you know we saw many problems uh, in which uh, there were at least more than one degree of freedom that could be defined as a single degree of freedom. And of course, if you use that as a generalized displacement quantity, okay, then the equation of motion corresponding to that generalized displacement quantity was different from another one which was uh, using another degree of freedom. But essentially, uh, they were relatable to each other based on the relationship between the two generalized single degree of freedom uh, generalized displacements. Because if it is a single degree of freedom system, you always have one unknown and obviously any other uh, thing is related to that one unknown. Okay? So, we saw that. Today, we are going to be continuing to look at generalized and equations of motion. The only difference is that we shall be looking at uh, essentially systems which are not really single degree of freedom uh, systems, but are rather they are actually multi degree of freedom systems. Uh, and in fact, we will see that they are actually continuous systems which we can take a uh, consider as a uh, single degree of freedom problem. Let us let us see how this is. Let me draw. A cantilever and this cantilever I am going to say that well when it deflects what happens okay it is going to deflect like this and if I look at right if you look at this this is with x okay so this is u x of t now what we say is look this u of x of t is given by a xi x times z 0 of t and z 0 of t in this particular case I will define as this displacement right. So, that is z 0 of t. The degree of freedom is z 0 of t. So, if we write it in this form where we say that this is known. If we say that then this continuous system given by u x of t transforms to single degree of freedom system with z 0 of t as the only unknown. Now, if that become then, then the question here is that I should know xi of x. So, let us look at a, a specific problem. Let us look at a situation where uh, let me take the cantilever itself and let us say that how do I write it in terms of uh, this. So, let us look at what happens. Okay. By and large what does xi x have to satisfy? Xi x is any thing which satisfies 
geometric boundary conditions and is unit corresponding to z 0 of t. Okay? So, so, now if I look at it in this particular case how what kind of a xi x would I have? What are the bound, geometric boundary conditions? The geometric boundary conditions are that u at x 0 sorry u at 0 t is equal to 0 and u dash 0 of t is 0. Displacement in this direction is 0 and the slope is 0. So, xi x is unit here okay, and has to satisfy the fact that. So, in other words this becomes xi 0 is equal to 0 and xi prime is equal to 0. Okay? These are the only two that they have to satisfy and if that is the case then all we have is well look at it xi x equal to x by L squared that satisfies the boundary conditions because look at it if I differ if I put x equal to 0 I get 0 if I differentiate it I get 2 x upon L squared put x equal to 0 you get 0. So, this is valid right xi x 1 minus cosine pi x by 2 L. Well, let us look at this. If, the, if I put x equal to 0 here, it becomes 1 minus 1. So, it becomes 0 and I differentiate it. So, then the, what does this become? This becomes a sin pi upon 2 L sin pi x upon 2 L. That is what happens. Put x equal to 0, this becomes 0. So, this is also an equally a valid uh, system. Then xi x is equal to 3 x upon L cubed minus 2 x upon L squared. If we take consider this as my uh, you know equation, this also is valid because note that you know this is a higher order than this obviously it will satisfy. Okay. Uh, sorry, this is 3 x squared minus 2 x L cubed. Now, obviously, if you put x equal to 0, this disappears. Then you differentiate it. What do you get? You get 6 x upon L minus 6 x up x squared upon L cubed. So, if you put x equal to this, it becomes 0 minus 0. So, this becomes 0. Okay? So, all of these are all valid and note that all of them at x equal to L, let us look at, at x, well, it, it has to be 1. This obviously x equal to L is 1. Put this x equal to L, this becomes L upon L 1 squared minus 2 1. Okay? Look at let us look at this put x equal to L what happens cosine pi over 2 what is cosine pi over 2 0 1 minus 0 is 1 all of them satisfy the geometric boundary conditions and is unit. So, all of these are valid which one is exact well to find out which one is exact we have to actually solve this continuous problem. Later on in the course, we shall be looking at that problem also and we will see what would happen as the exact answer to this. None of these by the way are the exact solution because note that under any kind of load, the xi x actually becomes a completely different. So, it does not matter and note that under a load, whatever you get and under the inertia force you get different. So, you know all of these are equally valid and all of them are equally 
uh, approximate. Okay? So, this then becomes the fact that this is how by defining any arbitrary shape function, I change the problem into just z 0 t. Now, the question is that okay, so if z 0 t is the degree of freedom, then obviously, my uh, equation has to be of, the, of this form m star z 0 double t c star z 0 t plus k star z 0 is equal to p star t and this is the equation that we have to get. Now, note that in this particular case, I am going to drop this term because remember that uh, we had said that you know when I looked at rigid body assemblages, I put in dash pots, etcetera. Okay, and now you know in a, in a in a cantilever you you don't have dash pots. So for now, I will just drop this term, and what we'll see is we'll see if we can derive these, this, and this for the specific kind of a deformable body. Okay. So, let us look at this situation. So, I am saying that I have this okay, and let us say that this is E i is its flexural rigidity and m bar is the mass okay, and let us say that it is subjected to a load which is given in the following format. I will say that the load is given as zeta x into p naught of t. Okay. In other words, what we are saying is, okay, remember if it is a uniform load, what is zeta x? Well, it is zeta x is nothing but 1. Okay. So, this zeta x looks at the variation of the load and this defines this is the load per unit length which defines the intensity at a particular point. So, this then is typically how this load you know per unit length uh, is defined. Okay. So, this is typically how a dynamic load looks because the T variation T variation is independent of the the other variation, okay? So, because it's typically like what sin omega t, or it's harm, you know, uh, it's some harmonic, or it's some you know pulse load, all of those kinds of things, but a unit uh, load, okay? So that's why I'm saying that this gives you the the spatial variation, and uh, otherwise it is uh, the thing, okay? So this is how this entire thing is defined. So, E i is the thing. Now, how do we solve this problem? Well, let us see. Let me give it a displacement and the displacement is where this is z 0 t and u x of t is equal to xi x z 0 t. Okay? So, this is my displacement at a particular point. So, if I have displacement at a particular point given by this, the inertial force is automatically equal to m bar d x, which is an infinitesimal length at a distance x. So, that is m bar d x into u double dot x of t. Okay? So, that is the inertial force that you have. Okay? What about due to the, the flexure, what kind of a load is set up over here? If you look at the, the uh, internal force or should I say, I will call that spring force and that is actually m x at a particular point m x by definition is given by E i into 
del squared u by del x squared. Okay. So, that is the flexional moment due to this dis, uh, displacement. Okay. And you know, uh, well, that's it. I mean, let's just go with these are the, the forces. Now, now the question then becomes that okay, we found out the forces under under the deformation. Now, what do we do? Well, the best way to do is write down an equation of equilibrium because ultimately, if you look at this, this looks like an equation of equilibrium. And we already looked at last time that you can use the principle of virtual displacement to solve this particular problem. Okay, so then how does the how do we get that? Well, let's see. Virtual displacement look like I'll give it a virtual displacement where virtual displacement is note that this does not vary with x because there's a virtual displacement, right? So those are the forces undergoing this virtual displacement. And what kind of virtual displacement pattern do I give? Well, I'll give xi x into del z 0 right in other words over here this is del z 0 i'll give the same i mean the this will be given by this because even if when i give it a virtual displacement the pattern has to remain the same as the previous one okay so let's see what do i get well the the work done by the inertial forces into del u x is going to be equal to m bar d x u double dot x of t into del u x and this is for an inferential so we have to go from 0 to this is 0 and this is l ok so it has to go from 0 to l so what does this become let's substitute all of these terms See u x of t is given by xi x z 0. So, u double dot is going to be equal to xi x into z 0 naught. So, this is going to be equal to z 0 naught t that goes outside and del 0 is del 0. So, this goes outside and inside uh, uh, what do we get? We get 0 to l m bar. Now, one of them is xi x coming from z 0 and the other is del u xi x. So, I basically get xi squared x dx and that is the work done by the real inertial forces undergoing the virtual displacement. Okay? So, this is what we get over here. Now, let us look at the next step and which is the work done by the bending moment undergoing the virtual displacement. Okay? And if we look at that, then, then this is what happens. Let us look at what happens in the next term. A moment m x. So, the work done by the m x is going to be equal to del theta x. Okay? Note that this is m x into del theta x. Now, this del theta x is actually equal not del theta x, but it is equal to. In other words, if I look at this, this is my d x. Note that I have m x here and m x here and note that what we have is that I have m x and m x. So, if you look at it, this particular term, if you look, I am going to draw it larger, you will see that this is equal to, if this is my del d theta x, right? This is the, so then the work done is actually m x into del d theta x by d x into d x. Right? That is what we have. Because if you look at it, this del d theta x is going to be equal to over length d x, whatever the rate of change of the rotation that is given over here. 
Okay. Now, M, if I substitute, this is the work done by the internal forces. So, if I look at M i, M i is equal to E i into xi prime z of t. Because again, if you look back, if u x of t is given in this form, u double prime, that is del u x of t by del x squared is going to be just the di phi prime by d, d x squared into z naught. Di phi is given by xi prime. Okay? So, this into z t is my m x and this one if you look at it is going to be equal to now what is d theta by d x d theta by d x by definition is del squared v by del x squared. So, this entire thing becomes then nothing but xi prime into del z 0 into d x and this is for an interstitial. So, this entire thing has to be from 0 to l. So, if you look at this, this is going to be equal to z of t del 0, 0 to l e i double prime x the whole squared d x. This is the work done by the internal forces and now let us look at finally, the work done by the load. Now, the load is what? At any point, the load is given by p bar x of t. Okay? So, now if you look at this p bar x of t, so then the lo load is given as p bar x of t into d x. That is the load per infinitesimal uh, length. That is the load and what is the work done? It is equal to del u x. So, if you look at this, this is equal to p bar x of t into xi x dx 0 to l because this is obviously integrated and I have del z 0 here. Okay? So, now, now the question becomes that look the work done by your uh, external uh, forces is always positive and the work done by the internal forces is always negative because so that is why this one actually becomes something like this. Okay? So, the external forces are these and the internal forces is the work done by elastic forces which is the bending moment and the work done by the inertial forces. So, putting all of those down, I get this. Integrated from 0 to L, m bar x xi squared x dx into z 0 del 0 plus integral from 0 to L e i x d x into z 0 del 0. These are the internal forces and the work done by the external forces is 0 to L p bar x of t xi x dx. So, in other words, if you really look at it, this is all of them have del z 0. So, that you know, I am just going to eliminate that because del z 0 is an arbitrary uh, displacement. So, this term is my m star, this term is my k star and this term is my p star. Okay? So, the final equation then becomes m star z okay so that's what happens over here so now the question then becomes that 
this is this is the equation of motion and uh, my m star I will just rewrite these terms that we have looked at uh, we will just desc describe these if you look at m star m star is equal to 0 to l m bar x xi squared x dx k star is equal to 0 to l e i xi prime squared x dx and p star is 0 to l Okay, now if you look at this particular thing, you will see excepting for this, this and this are things that we have developed already for the generalized single degree of freedom system, which was for the rigid body assemblages, right? These are exactly the same as that. Now, the question then becomes is that this is the only term that comes in and this comes in due to the deformation. In other words, when you deform a body in this form, it tries to go back to this. So, in a way, this is like a spring constant, equivalent spring constant that represents the inertial, the elastic uh, force that comes from the, uh, that comes into the equation because k star into z. So, k star is like an equivalent uh, spring force. Okay? Now, having develop this let us now try to solve this problem for a specific case let me take the specific case I am going to put a UDL on it okay and then I am going to put this as my degree of freedom. Okay. So, this is p bar t. In other words, it is a constant, it is not a, fu a function of x. Okay. And I have e i and m bar also as constants. In other words, what we have is that this is a uniform bar with uniform distribution of mass subjected to uniform distributed load and I want to write down the equation of motion in terms of this and I shall use xi x to be equal to x upon L squared. I am assuming xi x to be equal to x upon L squared. Okay? So, if I do that, well let us see what does the equation happen in terms of this. Now, you know without going in, let us go and look at the way we have developed it. So, if you look at it, this was m star is equal to 0 to L m star xi x squared dx. Right? So, if we look at this, what does this become? M, m star is a constant, m bar is a constant. So, m bar goes outside and this becomes 0 to x and this is xi squared. So, this becomes xi l fourth dx. Okay. So, this becomes m bar l fifth upon 5 l fourth. So, this is equal to 0.2 m bar l. Okay? So, my m star is equal to 0.2 m bar l. Now, what is my k star? My k star is equal to 
0 to L E I Okay, so if your xi x is equal to x by L squared, then xi prime x becomes 2 x upon L squared and xi double prime becomes 2 upon L squared. So, if I just do this, so 2 upon L the whole squared, this basically becomes k star is equal to E i 4 E i upon L fourth 0 to L d x which is equal to 4 E i upon L cubed. So, that is my k star and what is my p star? My p star is going to be equal to is going to be equal to 0 to L p bar xi x d x. So, p bar goes out 0 to L x upon L squared d x. So, this becomes p bar L cubed upon 3 L squared. So, this becomes 1 third p bar L. Okay, so, this becomes this. So, ultimately what is my equation look like for that particular for this particular problem? The, it become it looks like this 0.2 m bar L z naught plus 4 e i upon L cubed z naught is equal to one third p bar l. Now, let us look at the units that we have. m bar l is mass units because m bar is mass per unit length, m bar l is mass per unit. Now, E is Newton per meter squared, I is meter fourth. So, this becomes Newton meter squared, Newton meter squared by meter cubed become Newton per meter. So, this is units of a linear spring constant Newton per meter and p bar L is load. p bar is load per unit length into L is load. So, you see this entire thing this is my k star, this is my m star and this is my p star. Let us look at something interesting. What is the free vibration frequency going to be equal to? It is by definition k star upon m star and this if you look at it is equal to 4 e i upon l squared divided by this. This basically becomes 0.2 goes up. So, this becomes 20 e i m bar L fourth. Okay. Uh, so, now let us look at this Newton meter squared. This is kg meter fourth. So, if you look at this, this basically becomes uh, radians per second square root. This basically becomes per second squared and if you look at this, this is. So, this is my if I use xi x equal to x by L squared. My omega turns out to be this. Now, is this the true frequency, first frequency of vibration of this particular uh, cantilever? Well, no. Why? Well, this is an approximation. The approximation, it is an approximation to the true value. Okay? Now, now let us look at a, another uh, situation. Let us look at using the 1 upon x by L as my uh, value. Okay? So, if we look at that, then what we get is, so I am going, uh, you know, I have just used xi x equal to uh, x upon L the whole squared. 
Note that all three that we have de defined before are equally valid in terms of uh, equation. I mean, as a as a, a shape function. Okay, so xi x is known as a shape function, by the way, because it is it defines the shape with unit amplitude corresponding to the degree of freedom. Okay, so that's why it's called the shape function. Xi x is the shape function. Okay, so now let's look at the same problem, excepting that I am going to define xi x to be given by 1 minus cosine pi x upon 2 L. Okay. I am going to define this as my shape function. What I, why am I doing 2? Because I want to show you that whatever this equivalent single degree of freedom that I get is actually an approximation. Okay. Note that earlier when we looked at uh, for the specific things about the generalized single degree of freedom with rigid bar assemblages, those were exact single degree of freedom. The xi x was unique. Okay, here you know xi x all that it has, has to satisfy is it has to satisfy the boundary conditions and it has to satisfy that corresponding to the degree of freedom it is 1. So, that is all the shape function has to satisfy. Okay, so let's see. Uh, plug in xi x equal to, and let us see uh, xi prime is equal to pi upon two l sine pi x by two l, and xi prime is equal to pi upon two l the whole squared cosine pi x upon 2 L. Okay? So, these, these are I am deriving these up front and also the fact that m star is equal to remember m bar x xi squared x dx k star is equal to 0 to L E i x xi prime squared d x and p star is equal to 0 to L p bar x t into xi x into d x. Okay, given that, let us now try to find out what values do I get for uh, with this xi x. Okay. So, let us try to find out m star. So, now m bar comes outside because it is a constant 0 to L 1 minus cosine pi x whole squared d x. So, therefore, what we get is equal to now this becomes what this becomes equal to m bar one minus two cosine pi x by l plus cosine squared pi x by two l. Now note that cosine essentially if you look at it becomes nothing but well I am going to use uh, another uh, this thing and that is that I know that cosine 2 theta I am going to define this is equal to cosine squared minus sine squared and note that since this is equal to see cosine theta if I if I subtract 1 from this if you look well anyway let me rewrite this. this becomes 
1 minus cosine pi x. Remember that? Okay. This is 1 minus. So, what you get is you get it equal to 2 cosine theta minus 1. And so, if you look at this cosine squared theta becomes half of cosine 2 theta plus 1. Okay. So, I am going to plug that in. So, what is this going to be equal to? This implies that this is equal to m star 0 to l 1 minus 2 cosine pi x upon 2 l plus half of cosine pi x upon l. Note that 2 of this is equal to this plus 1 dx. So, if you look at that, what we get is this is equal to, so m star becomes equal to m bar 0 to l. This becomes 3 by 2 minus 2 cosine pi x upon 2 l plus half cosine pi x upon l. Okay. So, this is what we get this into d x and if you look at this, this becomes m star and then inside I am going to put 3 by 2 l. Okay. Then minus. Now, let us see when I differenti differentiate this, this becomes 2 l. So, this 2 and 2, this becomes 4 l upon pi and this integration becomes sin pi by x. So, if you look at x, this is going to be 0 and when you do this, you get sin pi by 2. So, that becomes 1. So, this is minus 4 1 by 0 and plus on this side again you have L upon 2 pi and look this is cosine. So, when I integrate this I get sin pi x upon L. So, when I put x equal to L I get sin pi, sin pi is 0 and so both are 0 minus 0. So, what I get is equal to 3 by 2 minus 4 by pi. Okay. So, this becomes 3 by 2 minus 4 by pi m bar l. And if you look at this one, this one turns out to be equal to 1.5 and this particular one. Okay. This anyway, let us just leave it in uh, this fashion. We will derive this later on, but you will see that 3 by 2 and 4 upon pi is approximately about 1.32. So, this is going to be about 0.18, about 178L. So, this is approximately about 0.18 m bar L. Okay. That is what you get. And if you look at K star, K star turns out to be equal to E i 0 to L xi squared double prime squared d x. So, this becomes equal to E i into 0 to L and xi pr double prime we have already done. Xi double prime was equal to uh, pi 
upon 2 L cosine pi x upon 2 L the whole squared d x. So, this is going to be equal to pi squared upon 4 L squared. So, I am going to take that outside. So, this is going to be equal to pi squared e i upon 4 L squared into 0 to L cosine squared pi x upon 2 L into d x and this we have already seen what this is equal to. This is equal to pi over 2 sorry e i 4 upon L squared is equal to this one becomes half and half the other one disappears. So, this is going to be equal to this into inside is going to be equal to half. So, L by 2 plus L by 2 pi 0 minus 0. So, what we ultimately get is equal to pi squared E i upon 4 L cubed, which is equal to approximately about 2.4 or thereabouts E i upon L cubed. And if you look at this, uh, if I look at omega, it is going to be 2.4 divided by point m bar. So, it is going to be E i m bar. So, if you look at omega, it is going to be equal to k star upon m star and this is going to be equal to approximately just over 20, about 22 E i upon m bar L fourth upon 10. Different. You see that this value is different from what we have got earlier. Okay. And if you look at it, so in other words, because why well, why should be different? They are both approximations and they are not the same shape function. No way. Okay. In the in the case of this thing, you saw that uh, the xi prime was a constant. Here, the xi prime varies with cosine. Okay, so obviously they are not the same function. Let me finally get the p star since we are being complete. Let's also do the p star. P star is zero by L p bar into cosine pi x upon two L d. So this becomes p star zero to L cosine pi x upon 2 L d x. This is equal to p star into 2 L upon pi sine pi x upon 2 L 0 to L. So, what we get is it is equal to I am so sorry this is 1 minus cosine. So, there is a 1 minus cosine so, there is a 1 minus. So, this be basically becomes equal to p star into 1 minus the or oh, it becomes L actually L upon L upon 2 pi into L. So, this is equal to pre prime 1 minus 2 upon pi which is equal to point two six eight seven P bar L. Okay, so the equation then becomes the following. It becomes four minus pi M star plus pi squared E I upon sorry z double naught 0 plus pi squared upon 4 l squared 
z0 is equal to 0.2687 p bar p naught upon l. So, this is what we get as our definition of uh, this thing. So, this becomes essentially uh, this point exactly becomes equal to uh, point this is point 0.7313. So, this becomes 1.5 minus 2 times so, this becomes 4 upon pi uh, becomes 4 upon. So, this becomes 1.4 okay. we, we will do this later. I will I'll get you exact values for this. The question then becomes that this equation that you get for which xi x equal to 1 minus cosine pi x upon 2 L. This is the equation that you get. Looks completely different. Okay? This is in other words what we are looking at. I shall leave it up to you to do the 3 x upon the other xi x term that I had given. That is 3 x upon L the whole squared minus 2 x upon L the whole cubed that xi x, I will leave that as an exercise for you to do. Okay? So, I shall stop over here. Thank you very much. Bye.